I'm interviewing Dr. Steve Schneider, climate scientist at Stanford University and National Geographic Fellow and publisher of the new book, Science as a Contact Sport. Dr. Schneider, can you tell us a little bit about your book and why you've written it at this point in time? Well, thank you, David. Uh, so Science as a Contact Sport is already a pretty funny title. And the reason for that is for the almost 40 years I've been in this business, we were telling the Congress and and uh, ministers in Europe and all around the world about this problem in the 1970s. So the question I ask is if we knew then pretty much what could happen and even how to fix it through energy efficiency and alternative energy systems and sharing arrangements with developing countries like China and India, why didn't we get the job done? And that takes a whole book to explain and unfortunately some of the problems that we learned then are still going on comes down to really three basic things. Scientific community is honest, but not generally very articulate. And we tend to like things to be finished before we talk about them. So we wait for consensus, but by then it's too late to prevent some dangerous outcomes. So there's one reticence. Number two, there are special interests people inside of industries that would be hurt by policies that increase price of energy, for example. And they're organized and they hire PhDs, literally hired guns, to sit there and say it's not true. And then the media, trained in political reporting, right? Get the Democrat, get the Republican. Fair and balanced in political reporting. But climate science isn't end of the world versus good for you. Those are the two lowest probabilities. So no wonder everybody's confused. We've got a complex issue that gets dumbed down to true or false when in fact it's a series of gradations with many serious outcomes, not every one of them, and it's complicated. So it's a problem that really challenges democracy. How can a democracy function when an issue is complex, yet people's understanding is critical to the political solutions? Now you've done a great job in the book of outlining the process and the debate over many years. And other than reading the book, which is obviously highly recommended, what would you tell people to do to get information they can rely on? Well, I can never blame anybody for being confused when two PhDs are out there making opposite claims. So the first thing they have to try to do is find out what's a credible claim. Well, a generic. Watch out for the myth busters and the truth tellers, the ones who have got the absolute answer of truth. When you hear somebody apologizing a little bit for the components we haven't figured out, talking in bell curves, saying that we shouldn't risk this because we're talking about the survival of the planetary life support system, not because we're sure, but we're buying insurance, they're much more likely to be telling you the truth than somebody who says, oh, no, no, it's not proved and it won't be proved for decades, or somebody else who says it's absolutely established, we must immediately stop it the day after tomorrow. So people can learn to do that. There are many good websites the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Energy, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NASA. There are many good university websites. There are European websites, even my own, climatechange.net. There are so many places where you can go to get the story straight. But when you do, it's not going to be in a soundbite. It isn't going to be, here's the truth. It's going to be, here the range of outcomes. And why you as a citizen have to understand it well enough to know how you want to act to try to slow it down, both personally at home and politically at the national level. Now, we're a few weeks away from the climate treaty talks in Copenhagen. What do you hope is going to happen, will be the outcome of that meeting, and what is likely to happen? Copenhagen is when the world gets together to try to admit that the climate problem is the collective footprint of all kinds of individual, corporate, and national activities. So nobody can solve it alone because nobody created it alone. But we're not all equal. The U.S. is the largest historical emitter. China is now the largest individual emitter. So there are countries with a special responsibility. But everybody's got to be in the game. Therefore, we have got to replace the C word they teach us in business school, competition, with the C word we need to solve the planetary crisis, which is cooperation. So if you're a Chinese or an Indian, Brazilian, Mexican, you say, wait a minute, I only pollute one quarter as much as you rich guys in the United States or Europe, so we'll catch up to you, then we'll take targets. But if you multiply that times they're having four times more people than we do, we have a planetary sustainability train wreck. We need to make a deal. 
We have to help them literally leapfrog over the Victorian Industrial Revolution with sweatshops and polluting industries like coal burning and internal combustion engines to high technology, to smart grids, to wind and solar, and maybe even smart nuclear, a wide range. Nothing should be completely off the table. But in order to fund that, we need cooperative deals. And Copenhagen, at its best, will structure cooperative deals. At its worst, we'll blame each other, point fingers, say the other guy's responsible, and go nowhere. I hope that doesn't happen. And with Obama as the president, I'm very hopeful that will not happen. So you made the case for how we can deal with one another at a national level. To conclude, other than reading your book again, what do you advise individual people can do to make a contribution. Yeah. Well, one of the stories that I tell in Science of Contact Sport is when my students at Stanford said, but Professor Schneider, what can we do? We don't have any authorization to negotiate with the Chinese. Indeed. So I asked them, you turn your computer off when it's on? Well, sometimes they do and don't. That's important. Turn the lights out? Yeah. Are you consumers? Of course. Do you buy local produce? Well, sometimes. You know, local produce is a lot less embedded carbon. Do you guys, when you go out to buy a car, do you read the EPA mileage? Yeah, we do, but not always. Do you get your folks to be very careful when they're buying refrigerators and air conditioners and other things to read the label? Are you buying Energy Star? Are you students having group discussions so that you can understand the nature of the problem so that when people give you polemical attacks, you're equipped to argue with them? Do you go to the town council and say, why don't we have light emitting diodes saving this, this town money and reducing our footprint? Get your town to link to other towns. And when the politician comes along, you know, an honest politician, not always an oxymoron, are you having parties to help them? Are you sending them checks? Are you sending them letters saying, go for it because these people are always being attacked by the other side they need your help so we need to have coalitions of people who know what they're talking about and are out there making a difference while at the same time our own lifestyle has as low a footprint as we can afford and then later on when you are in a better position in life maybe you will negotiate with the Chinese. Professor Schneider you said right at the end of the book you had some advice for what we tell our children do you want to repeat that? Well, I love to uh, play a 12-string guitar. It gives me relaxation because following all these world's problems can be pretty frustrating. And I end line when somebody once said, what's the most important thing we can do? And I just quoted an old line from Crosby, Stills, and Nash from decades ago, teach the children well. They have to know that we're there for them, but they have to know that they've got to learn how to help us to find what they want, which is not always more and more things but a world that's safe and sustainable. Thank you so much for coming to National Geographic today and telling us about your new book. Thank you, David.